As retailers entered the lockdown in March 2020, a small, diverse group of Canadian thought leaders gathered to virtually speculate, collaborate, and share their insights on the waves of disruption facing retailers. The Business of Retail podcast emerged as an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional discourse, revealing challenges in the headlines and exploring new, unconventional paths for all facets of the retail industry. Now, here's the panel. Welcome, everyone, to the Business of Retail podcast. We've got a special guest here again today for part two. Uh, we've got Claude Cielo. He's the uh, former president of retail at Ivanhoe Cambridge. We're also joined with our regular guests. I'm going to read them on the order of my screen. We've got Gary Newbury, George Minakakis, Christine Cowan, and David Ian Gray. And I'm Craig Patterson as well. So thank you so much. Um, last uh, segment, we uh, talked about what's happening in physical retail um, with a particular focus on landlords and developers uh, leading up to COVID. And uh, this is part two, which we're going to be talking about the broad opportunities to rethink uh, the retail, uh, physical retail space. Um, and uh, first, we're going to run a video here, and then we're going to uh, break into the conversation. to be back uh, with you and talk about uh, retail going forward. So the video that was just shown, I um, particularly like you know, what it's all about. It's all about emotions, uh, innovation, uh, connection, partnership. And I think those elements are gonna be so important going forward for the retailers in order to distinguish themselves in the market, but also really bringing physical and digital all together but also bringing novelty uh, uh, at the same time and, you know, having some movement in the stores, which I, which I you know, I think will be key uh, uh, in order for, uh, to distinguish between the offline and online shopping so that, uh, you know, for sure retail is going to be, is going to be definitely different going forward. And that's a pretty good video. That, that, that is a store and it's concept that will open in London on uh, Regent Street in 2021. Um, I think even they're looking at, at maybe uh, uh, opening it up in, in, in shopping centers as well. But uh, I really like, you know, the fundamentals and the principles behind it. I think the last uh, segment we, when we were trying to explore where we came from, we almost ended on a little bit of a down note because there's a lot of blockage uh, that, that started to build up in terms of disconnects between uh, institutional developers and landlords and then the legacy retail sector that isn't navigating what they're doing very well and the COVID's brought in uh, some behaviors but when you show that video you can really see the power of what things could be and uh, I gotta ask you this though for everyone when's the last time you saw a very inspiring retail development that felt different because that certainly does. But I was trying to think, you know, can we can we latch on to something and say, hey, we, we did that and it started to inspire change. Maybe it's lifestyle concepts. I don't know. But that's a long time ago. 
I think, um, you know, sort of innovations around uh, retailers like Canada Goose uh, doing its mm -hmm. freezer room and particularly the one in Shearway Gardens, which I haven't visited, so I, I've yet to do it, where they have no stock. They have things you can try on, et cetera. And I think that as retailers and maybe working with the landlords, we have to find new ways. And I think that maybe COVID will allow us all to look at this whole this whole paradigm in a very different way and come up with new concepts. I think the role of a landlord has changed and they have to find retail concepts that can come into a, a, a public space, a mall, a shopping center, a high street, a main street, and put those together much as a merchandiser would put an assortment together. Maybe the landlord's role going forward may be to create very different kind of concepts by bringing different retailers together and present them, presenting them to a community, to the public, and say, "Come here, we're a destination. We're we're, we're raring to go to to satisfy your your needs and wants." I think um, clothes call out on just experience and um, consumers wanting a differentiation and innovation and in what they're looking for is going to be really key. And I think there's a lot of conversation around. Now it's been almost a year of lockdown. We're really ready to experience new things. And that means eventually once the vaccine gets out, coming out into the world and experiencing things and maybe experiencing things in a different way. So if we're not traveling as much, like what are things that can happen from a retail landscape that can bring excitement and interest, something new and different to consumers? And I think the places that are gonna have um, the opportunity for people to be outside, for them to potentially interact with different spaces, for mo more opportunity with spaces to evolve and change. So we've started seeing these little kiosks in the mall where you have brands like Peloton come in and a consumer can come and check out the product. Um, and those are things that allow smaller businesses potentially to come in and test the waters before they go to a larger door. Um, but I think we have to constantly change and evolve. And it's just like anything, consumers get tired of seeing the same old thing and the same old concept. So what's gonna be new and different? How are we gonna bring um, retail spaces alive? And as we look to where we work and live and if things change and we're not commuting as much, it's gonna be really around the spaces that we live, eat and breathe in. And that includes um, you know, having the services that we need close by, the opportunity to kind of do the things that we wanna do and experience things. Um, in a more kind of maybe centralized way than driving out to a mall out in the burbs and, and doing that kind of thing. So I do think innovation, change, and um, people that are willing to embrace something different are going to be the ones that come out the winners. Uh, I just think we all want something different. We're ready for something different. And this year has really proven to us that it's time for change in so many ways. So uh, why not in our retail spaces that we you know are going to? Well, I think that's fundamentally you know behind my question which is you can do one thing a bit different and everyone can follow suit but then it seems to get locked in for a long time so i think one of the differences needs to be a faster pace of refresh and and, and i don't know quite how that works i'm not solving it but the last time i got really excited i was late to the game but i finally got to shortage in east london in the box park um <clears throat> pop-up area and I have to say between the Banksy stuff on the on the buildings and the and, and those uh, containers, it was really cool and a lot of vintage shop or shops around there. So I felt like it was in something totally different. But that was the last one for me. And I think the challenge, Christine, is twofold. One is the, the examples that we see socially or at the conferences tend to be in very, very dense population zones like New York or London or in the big cities in Asia. But if you think about Canada, we're not really, I mean, we're, we're spread out and we're less populated. So we're gonna be more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. How do you mainstream a little bit of this innovation? And I guess the other one is how do you keep it fresh and not just lock into the next thing for 10 years? Yeah. So, so I, I think under, underlying that is the actual financial arrangements between a retailer and a and a landlord, whereas typically there have been, you know, 10 years or whatever it might be, a long period of time. So you bring in a brand new concept and 
if it doesn't quite work out, you're stuck with it. It doesn't particularly advantage Arita if they found it, their way into a mound in the wrong traffic position, whatever it might be. But over time, they can kind of work on that. But would it lead, are you suggesting that maybe some of the tenancies need to be much more vibrant, much a quicker turnaround so that you know, bring a concept in, does it work? Yes or no, in which case, bring the next one in, in the same space, shut the other one out. It, 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 if I, if I may, David's question was, you know, to the last time I remembered something that really inspired me, it was the store was called Build a Bear. Uh, because, no, it wasn't for me, David. But the point was, you know, I mean, if you think I, I don't about, believe that, George, but go oh, ahead. I, st I still sleep with it, but that's another story. <laughs> but here's the point. I mean, where else could you go to get a marvelous experience for a yeah. kid and the parents or whoever was, you know, and you build a bear that you take it home, you put your own heart, whatever soul you want to that into that bag of beans and, and away you go. When was the last time you were touched by a retailer in that way? When? been a long time yeah. yeah right so you know i get the part I, I i i respect what christina said about the innovation and the experience and everything i agree i think a lot of retailers fail to continue to innovate yeah you know, it's, it's you know it's it, sorry uh, george but you know i i i'm, I'm sitting here and then there's one common denominator in everything that you've been saying okay which is engagement and that notion of engagement you know, uh, uh, powered by technology and innovation uh, will be uh, super interesting to see post-COVID. Because, yep. you know, like, I think the shopping centers, ultimately, uh, I think we have to, we have to kind of remove the notion of shopping, okay? And call this consumer engagement space. Because, you know, we, we, it, 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 yes, ultimately, it may result in shopping and conversion. But I, I think what's most, most critical and more, and more important is for the retailers to engage differently with their consumers, to show products, to uh, develop a, uh, a, a, you know, a loyalty that's different uh, than what you, you know, uh, uh, could find online. But... You know, that being said, I think first and foremost, and we see it today, uh, I think one fundamental, fundamental thing that, you know, will uh, uh, remain post-COVID is creating safe places, mm -hmm. right? Restore confidence. Uh, and this is, this is going to take, I think it's going to take more than months. I think we've been into, into this for so long that, you know, has become, you know, habits and now we have developed, you know, behaviors toward all those high touch areas and contact with people. Uh, I know, in, in, I mean, in the States right now, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Christine, you may talk about it, but uh, uh, they've opened up in Texas, uh, you know, uh, um, and, and everybody's so excited, so pumped up, you know, to, to meet again, to socialize again, which, you know, is, is just wonderful and gives everybody hope right, uh, going forward. But I think from a behavior, consumer behavior point of view, it will take some time before we, you know, go back to uh, an environment that we were accustomed and familiar with uh, in the past. That being said, your point on innovation uh, is absolutely totally bang on. Um, I think uh, the point on the relationship between landlord and tenant uh, oh my God, hopefully this pandemic will um, elevate uh, this relationship to a different level than just a, a pure 60 page lease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, hopefully this will elevate uh, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the exchange of data, consumer data, property data, um, you know, the, the, um, exchange of, of marketing initiatives uh, that could be you none know, of partnerships, you know, that's the other element I think that I think I, I believe should be uh, uh, super interesting is what relates to partnership going forward. Those, you know, never thought of partnerships between a retailer and another brand yeah. to bring excitement, to bring novelty, to bring another different of engagement with the consumers. I think those are going to be 
uh, super, super interesting going forward. So what, what do you think are the ingredients that need to come together, particularly on the landlord and developer side? Because we, I mean, we could talk about internal to retailers themselves for sure, but on the landlord developer side, what are the key ingredients that are going to uh, either speed up that process or uh, add, add fuel to it in any way? Um, saying, it... Right off the bat, uh, David, it's, it's trust. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's like love. Both sides have to feel it. Uh, and I'm not so sure right now there's been a lot of love shared in the last few months between the landlord and the retailers. Yeah, and we talked about, you know, we talked offline about that, Claude, right? That, hey, maybe we spent too much time in the last segment talking about some of the behaviors and the trust uh, that got eroded during COVID. But I think it's important because we need that. That's got to be fueled for sure. And I kind of think it may be very maverick kind of brands, retailers, and and developers coming together, not your typical ones, maybe ones you've never you know, expected are going to pop up and, and try a fresh, because it's a fresh approach. It's not, it's not working the same way we've always w worked before. Yeah. Another thing that comes to mind is the openness. Um, once, once you have the trust established is the openness for, for that sharing of data, uh, genuine data, financial performance, uh, the, you know, origination of the sales, you know, uh, will be key that transparency uh, in addition to trust will, will, will be key. And I think those are the foundations of a new relationship between the landlord and the tenant going forward. Uh, you, you, you had an example, Claude, of a, of a new type of lease uh, that you saw. And I don't, I don't think we talked about that last segment that was emerging either in the UK or Europe that had some opt-outs built in. Like, I think to get that trust, there has to be something offered back, not just the same leases that signed in the past. Right. I mean, obviously, I mean, the, 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 the traditional leases are five and 10 year long, right? And then it gives time for the retailers to amortize their capex. So uh, what if we enter into an environment where there are, you know, multiple breakouts over the term of the lease, both sides, okay? Uh, if it performs, if it doesn't, if the store performs or the store doesn't perform, um, but also, you know, a base rent that is lower, you know, the entry level is lower, uh, but then there are, there, there's a performance mechanism and a sharing of profit, okay, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, both sides can really uh, uh, generate some, some, you know, pretty interesting money going forward. So that's the kind of lease environment uh, that is being explored in, in one mall in the, in the, in the UK. And then on top of that, they add uh, new metrics such as, um, footfall store uh, at, at the store level and as well as um, you know what relates to all the returns on on the on, on the bulk uh, I would say you know the buy online pick up in store but also on the returns so there there's an introduction of different new elements and new metrics in order to define you know the basis of the relationship between the tenant and the landlord which I think are pretty interesting now the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, it's, it's how does that translate in terms of a, a predictable, quote unquote, revenue stream for the landlord? And then, you know, he has to look back at all the food chains, you know, of, of you know, the, the, the financing and et cetera, and all his obligations as a mall owner and operator. And, and so everybody will have to get their heads, up, you know, around this new business model which uh, it will be interesting to see how it unfolds. Craig and I worked on a couple of projects where we had the kind of fun opportunity to play with the future um, built space for a, couple, for a municipality. Uh, and uh, one of the observations was both the city and the developers at the time, all their, between the zoning and then their general you know, checklist and blueprinting were all sort of based on 10 year old models in the past. And even something, you know, the idea of autonomous vehicles, if that were to play out and you've got an urban setting where it's autonomous cars having to do pickups and drop offs, is the city planning for that? Are the developers planning for that? Um, are the architects building flexibility into the actual building design? 
And Craig, you, you, you had a bunch of uh, kind of observations on, on that. Um, I, I don't want to name, name, name the project, but. And I, I, won't, I won't either, but yeah, certainly my concern around that was, uh, are we designing something that's going to be outdated? Because we've certainly seen that in the past with uh, commercial properties where uh, they've been developed uh, for a certain purpose at a certain time, and uh, they seem to uh, have lost uh, uh, their relevancy. Uh, one you know, example might be drone delivery, uh, or as we talk about autonomous vehicles, uh, how is that space going to be uh, uh, you know, utilized? And on top of that, what's the future retail experience? I think things are changing very, very quickly. I, I've had the opportunity to see some really exciting concepts. KitKat came out with a store concept. You can go in and there's sights and smells and sounds, and it's just such an exciting, fun place to be. You can have a custom-made Kit Kat done. They educate you. You can sit at a bar, and they'll, you know, they pour the chocolate, and they do it in front of you. It's so experiential. You can go to the Mealy Showroom um, at Yorkdale. They make three meals a day. If you go in there in the morning, they'll make you breakfast on in their equipment to show you how it works. Lunch, dinner, same thing. They'll give you a little meal, and so you don't really have to pay for a meal if you go to Yorkdale uh, shopping center. <laughs> can, you, can you sleep in Pottery Barn? Like, it, I, I'm just wondering if you could kind of... If they have done it, it. They have done it in Ikea, and apparently they've been arrested, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, don't trespass. And don't, yeah, don't do anything illegal or, or undesirable or unwanted, but... Um, <laughs> But, but, but yeah, certainly, yeah, exactly. I mean, how, do, how do you do to proof your real estate, you know, and, and what is the future of real estate? I, I look at, for example, the big box centers, you know, you go to the edges of cities and they've got these big stores with parking around them. And I say the greatest things about these is they can be demolished because I don't see them as a positive retail experience overall. You have to drive from place to place, but, but also I don't see them as that innovative, exciting, or the best way to capitalize on real estate. I think it works in places where it's cheap, but uh, you know where land is 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 not as valuable, but it, it certainly doesn't make sense. I think in you know the GTA, for example, to have uh, centers like that, and if they are there, their their lifespan should be temporary, uh, and, and maybe that's part of it in terms of flexibility, not to be wasteful and say, well, this is going to be yeah. demolished in ten years. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, the world may change very significantly. We've seen this during COVID. We've seen things change already, and and I I don't know where things are going to go. It's it's, it's exciting and a bit scary at the same time. I, I love think, the idea yeah. of adaptable building. Sorry, Christine, go ahead. I, was gonna say, I just, I love that you said the flexibility piece because yeah. I've just been thinking about that. Um, and there's some really cool examples of cooperatives. Um, one in particular down in California that um, sort of is like in a huge warehouse space. And, you know, their model is they've got some vendors that stay permanently, but it's kind of a strategy where you come in, you test the waters, they test you, um, and then you go to like phase two or phase three. And so as a consumer going into this space, you're always seeing something new and different. And then you're seeing some of the tried and true, but they're constantly like reevaluating and reconfiguring the space. So it's really exciting and interesting. And I think um, Anthropology is a brand that a lot of um, people really like because you get into those stores and there's this experience. And I think there's something about, you know, the average cons consumer in those stores spends much more time than they would in another store because you're going around and you're seeing these different things and experiencing different things. So I mean, the cooperative model could be an interesting thing in terms of um, just having that ability to transition and go through things. The other thing that I think has been really interesting and it's been going on for a while is just the concept of food carts and Oregon is filled with food carts and the ability to transition and change. So um, up in Bend, there's a really cool space where they've got like a, a fixed bar and um, kind of area where you can sit outside, there's fire pits, and then they've got a space where people can come and it's sort of like a modern food court um, and the, the, the trucks change. So you don't always have the same guy there there's a few that are mainstays but then they rotate them out so as a consumer if you're going there to grab a beer after skiing you're always having a different and new experience so there's something really interesting I think around that too and the ability to kind of change and bring newness to consumers to a space that is somewhat you know sort of fixated why does it see, seem or feel like it's the food guys who who really get how to be nimble and innovative and, and not so much the retailers, because now that you mentioned that, um, Dallas has a great area where they had a big stockyards and obviously that business has evaporated over time, but it's all shipping bays and they've turned that into a, a outdoor covered food hall, you know, and 
with chefs, best chefs in Dallas go in there, in and out of there. And, and chefs will work in other restaurants and there's a lot of malleability in that food space that I, you just, I don't know. You don't see that kind of collaboration happening or uh, nimbleness happening in retail. Probably because a menu, a menu can change. I mean, you can, you can switch up a restaurant concept probably faster than you could an established retail concept. That would be my thought. I mean, I know that some restaurants, you know, McDonald's is going to have its established menu, but it can still do new things or do things in different geographies. Uh, I think it depends, but uh, I'm working on a project right now where I'm talking to landlords and it was really interesting to see how uh, um, there was an incredible drop off of foot traffic when food and beverage places were forced to close. So in this case, we had food courts, which uh, were government mandated to be shut. Uh, the dwell time and uh, the visitors to the centers across this province plummeted when the food and beverage mm. businesses uh, could not have people come in and sit down because that's part of an experience and it brings people in, it brings them in more often. And it, it's something Claude will know better than anyone. It gets people to stay longer. You've got an increased dwell time because of food and beverage on top of everything else. And, uh, and you know, landlords before COVID were certainly saying, well, we need more full-size restaurants. We need a better elevated food experience. So we started seeing food halls opening around the country, Time Out Market in Montreal, uh, you know, Market at Square One in Mississauga. It, it's been interesting how, uh, again, trying to shake up that, uh, uh, you know, shopping center real estate uh, or, or just, you know, aggregate uh, shopping areas is really, they, you know, food and beverage has really been an important component to that in terms of mm -hmm. driving foot traffic well beyond the retail itself. Yeah. Oh, I agree. You're now seeing like mainstay, you know, retail um, locations, especially throughout the U.S. with really high end restaurants that you would never have thought would go into those spaces. But that's a draw. Absolutely. It is. It is. I mean, let, let's not forget also and let's put things into, into perspective. If I remember correctly, it's in 2014 that in the first time in history that the um, uh, amount of dollars spent in restaurants was greater than the amount of dollars spent in supermarkets, okay? And that was really generational, right? Because the millennials, I don't know, I got two millennials and they're willing to pay that, to, sorry, to pay that premium to get a meal, an experience, socialize. Uh, I mean, they're, they are, you know, uh, 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 enjoy food <laughs> differently than the, you know, generations before. Uh, so now, now obviously that line, right, has just gone dramatically down, you know, in terms of uh, dollars spent in restaurants, and then uh, uh, food and prepared food, you know, out of out of uh, markets and supermarkets, you know, has gone dramatically up. I may be wrong, okay, but once we're out of this, I think that line of dollars spent in restaurants will go back up. Right, it will be a little bit bumpy and painful, but I don't think that the millennials and the zillennials, you know, will change their behavior. They want to go out and socialize. Yeah. They want to have those, you know, crazy cocktails and you know, a, a, a taste some, you know, a, 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 a chef's uh, food. And so, I, this I I believe you know, we'll, we'll go back up. But in the meantime, unfortunately, all of our restaurant uh, operators and friends are, you know I mean, uh, suffering. And then, you know, there's a different you know, percentage of, of, uh, of restaurants that uh, will, you know, unfortunately have to close because of COVID. But I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, we're all excited to go out again, right? Uh, you know, they just, they just reopened the restaurants here in Quebec uh, for the orange coated uh, areas and shoot like it's it's crazy yeah so we'll see but that also you know goes into what i call experience economy everything that's experiential i think um will will i believe explode post-covid because i think we've been we've been uh confined uh, for so long that uh, we will we will enjoy this freedom differently going forward, and and, and people appreciate it, right? We've we've been so used to going out and doing this stuff and being up, out in the scene, but now it becomes something special again. So back to your point, it's an experience, and you go out and you have this amazing meal, and you really appreciate it a lot more than maybe you would have before. Um, 
So sorry, David, you were going to say something? Well, I'm just I'm struggling with all this because there's a counter trend, which is the ghost kitchens. And so do they stay? And as part of our portfolio of experience, ordering better food from a wider array of restaurants into the home, as opposed to just the pizza that we might have done in the past. And if so, then that kind of plays into the reinvention of some underutilized space, right? Like in parts of if there's areas more industrial, they could be right for ghost kitchens, um, which have their own knock on ripple effect disrupting, I don't want to say legitimate <laughs> restaurateurs, but a lot of those are getting funded by the, um, the DoorDashes and Uber Eats of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think there will be room for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, all those new concepts that have you know, been expanding because of COVID, um, I think they will you know, stabilize, reach, reach, uh, reach, reach a plateau. But those consumer behaviors that are, you know, now you know, we know, we know it's super easy to order a meal from your mobile phone, right? So we've been forced to do it and now we're doing it you know, in, in, in a, uh, um, uh, uh, it's natural way now. So, so yeah, some of it, some of it will certainly, certainly survive, survive the pandemic. Uh, I and the, the flexibility piece back to like, yeah, there's my favorite or favorite Mexican restaurant that we used to go and great experience always would enjoy having a meal there. Um, they did a little bit of takeout before COVID. Then they completely switched their model. Everything was takeout. And now things have opened up again and the lineups are crazy. But what's great is as a consumer, we have the choice to say, you know, it's Friday night. It's probably going to be crazy to get in there. Let's just order to go. Or it's Tuesday night. We'd probably be okay to get in there and, and let's go down. But we have that great option now that we might not have had before. So it's all about choice and flexibility for the consumer. And I think to your point, why not have the hybrid model? Like why not be able to do both? I mean, you definitely have to, have a business set up to run both, but um, yeah. it's back to that flexibility for people. Yeah, I know. I know that our uh, the restaurant industry is, is suffering, and and everybody is not necessarily at the different uh, uh, at the same level. Sorry, but I know well known restaurant operators out of Montreal that have just embraced you know this change, and and they have. Uh, um, developed new ways to reach out to uh, and respond to their consumers with takeout and deliveries well they do more business mm. today yeah than they were pre-covid and yeah. by a range of 30 40 percent 50 percent right um now how much of this will stick afterwards um we'll see but you know it, 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 it's interesting to see very interesting to see that, you know, and you know what, we got to give it to, you know, all of those that are having this entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirit of, you know, seeing a crisis, seeing opportunities through crisis. And, and I, I mean, I, I have a lot of admiration uh, for them. You and know? I, so, so going back to this notion of flexibility, there's also a, a pacing aspect to that. It's also the speed of being able to adapt and I was reflecting coming into the call, maybe around 2016, 2017, there was so much talk about there becoming a monoculture of retail. It was going to be Amazon, Alibaba, eventually Walmart, like the, the giants were going to get more giant and there'd be a, a dumbing down of the sector. And here we are in 2021 where I think we've never seen such an exciting abundance of new brands and new ideas hitting the scene. But the but again, Claude, the old model of where landlords would sign national leases with the big players with one stroke, what we're dealing with here, all the examples we're sharing are, are small guys who are out there hustling, but they probably can't sign a 10 year lease with good conscience. And they certainly can't sign across a number of properties. So I think again, like how, how do we start to build in the support structures uh for what we see coming which are just a multiplier of, of brands that want to find space you know agility will be super important you know for the the the, the ones that 
um, uh, will be able to distinguish themselves in this in, in, in the new environment in the new normal. Um, I think uh, agility, having this entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, I'm sorry, but the leasing guys will not have the same job than they're you know used to have uh, going forward. Um, I mean, obviously, it's been um, very, very challenging for them in the last few months. They've had multiple conversations with, uh, they had their own ICSC meeting every single day, right? The deal making sessions with the retailers every single day. Uh, but going, you know, post COVID, uh, the um, conversation, the uh, base of, of a relationship, will change, right? Uh, uh, the way they, their understanding of the financial statements, their understanding of the margins, their understanding of, you know, uh, the origination of, uh, uh, of the sales from a retailer, from an operator, uh, they'll have to get their heads around this over and beyond just, okay, here's the term, here's the rent, here are the can, and no, I'm not giving you a TI, and no, you have no free rent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you so, know, at the end of the day, the consumer is going to decide. Yes. What else will. Yeah. And I remind myself that when smartphone, when Apple launched a smartphone, all the other telephone companies, manufacturers were saying, oh, we don't see this market growing than more than a quarter million phones at $500. Who would buy it? Guess what? Right? When Netflix came along, same story. Oh, they don't know anything about the about the industry. They're just getting libraries and building them. No one's going to buy those subscriptions. Guess what? Right? Ad consumer adaptation is accelerating, and the problem is, to, as technology, as what you folks are mentioning, technology is accelerating. It's going to create new opportunities. There are going to be restaurant tours. There's going to be retailers. Cloud. I don't know why any mall or any developer would allow a retailer to come in that doesn't have a social media presence and a, an e-commerce platform. Why would you not, why would you invite them into the mall if they can't be that connected, right? It doesn't benefit anyone. But at the same time, we know that businesses are very slow in adaptation, whether it's finance or whether their balance sheet doesn't offer, or the bank doesn't give them the money, right? Or they're just not sure. Most of the time, it's, they're not sure. Mm -hmm. right? They see technology is changing so quickly, they can't keep up. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what comes down to it is the consumer. They're yeah. going to keep shifting gears. George, you're, you're, you're so right. And, you know, I'm, I'll, 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 I'll keep the name for myself, right? But I've seen, I've seen uh, an exchange of, of, of emails from one developer to a well-known uh, fashion international retailer. Um, and the, the, the nature of the the, um, the nature of the email was around uh, stop promoting your website on the uh, on the windows of the store in my mall. <laughs> remove remove your dot com website, you know. So to your point, the consumer will decide the challenge the the channel that they'll want to use. And 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 this is this is so so important. I mean. That line between, you know, physical and online, you know, is 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 it's just one market. It's just it's it's one market at the end of the day. But it's, it's just to say, you know, that those paradigm shifts, uh, I think, have accelerated in the last few months. The the only thing I'd add to that though is we're also learning as we go, right? Like I think the notion that. We're an all-knowing consumer who is dictating winners and losers. Uh, it's not quite happening that way. We're still figuring out when there's, we had to learn about Netflix and we, we had to figure out Apple. And But what they both did was they tapped into an underlying need. Maybe the way it showed up, we didn't know we were looking for it. Uh, so that's what's exciting right now with all the new concepts and formats getting thrown out there. We're going to be part of that discovery, but I don't think we get... To, I, I think we're, we're all in, in, in play. It takes someone to put something uh, imaginative in front of us before we can often say we like it. You yep. know what I mean, George? Yep. No, I, you know what? I, I am, uh, I'm a staunch believer that the consumer will, 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 will return uh, when none, no one can guess, right? And there'll be a division. You know, the younger generation will be out there a lot quicker than the older ones, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, everyone will return. But when they do, things will be different, right? I, I, as I said, shared with someone on a call today, um, that whatever was left over from December 2019 will finish whenever the market reopens, because that's not done yet. Mm -hmm. We can't move to the future that, until that is done. That's my personal belief. Well, Gary, I, I'd like to know, you've been a little bit quiet over there and you were talking about consumers, but there's got to be a lot of physical play within the supply chain right now as well. Yeah, I, and innovation on the built space as it relates to moving product. I, I'd just say a world where uh, perhaps um, one, one, one avenue is that uh, if the mall or shopping center or the main street wants to be a destination, it has to select those uh, retailers accordingly, but it has to add some value to those retailers, not only the space, but what they do in that space or what they do for those retailers. And I think that it may have been Ivanhoe who actually had started to move down a track of trying to get people to plug their POS systems and their websites into uh, a, a, a situation where they could actually fulfill orders across brands. And if that's the case, then we ought to be saying that uh, in, a, in a community area, we're your everything man, we're your destination and everything man. So you can either come to our come to our physical location and hang out and see lots of pop-ups, lots of excitement. And some of the, as Christine said, some of the, the normal things you would expect to see here, but maybe the Canadian Tower, bit the Home Depot, whatever it might be, uh, as standard, but lots of excitement around that. But also if you use our online services as a now, suddenly we can actually schedule your, 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 your orders together and deliver as one stop as opposed to, you know, you know, multiple um, carriers coming to your doorstep and you never know if you're going to be there or not and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think that uh, just as we're talking retail concepts and manuals and, and landlords, I think there is uh, definitely a, a supply chain element in this. And if we just extend that to things like marketplaces, where typically a marketplace is, I take your order and I send it to somebody else, and I get a bit in the middle, but they sort it all out. That's my brand. <laughs> and if I'm saying to a customer, if you shop here under this website, this product, I get it to you next day. But when it's this product, it's marketplace, so it's that person over there. I, th I think there needs to be much more integration. And when we think about the destination, do we want to be in there or not? Uh, our overall proposition as a, as a retailer, both online and uh, in, in store effectively or physically, and also as we expand the marketplace, how are we going to actually bring that into our brand as opposed to it's just on the web page. You want it? Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. So I, I think that I, th I think we're going to see a massive converge convergence of things. Perhaps some of the things aren't that clear to us right now, but we've still got another year or so of this, this weird time that we're working through and lots of things are going to change. Lots of events are going to happen. Vaccines in, out, whatever. Do new discoveries around, around the coronavirus. And this is all going to stall us before we get back to, let's call it shopping or however we want to do it, discovery. And the longer that goes on, the longer these, these new trends will start to emerge and innovation will just naturally happen. I think if we if we open up now, we've had a year, and some of those habits will have become embedded, like ordering online for the convenience of it. But I think there's still a long path to travel before we get to where where we think we're going to be heading. Gary, I thought I had the themes all parsed out in my head, which is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. But on the collaboration front, you just really open this up because it's now, I think, clear to me that it's not landlord tenant only. It's uh, technology and it's uh, the su suppliers, it's the shippers as well. And I think, wouldn't that be cool just to have a, a think tank session where you brought the parts together and just had them reimagine? Yeah. If you started with a fresh kick at this today, what would it look like? Yeah, just find um, an empty mound and say, right, guys, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. How's it, how's it going to be different that it doesn't end up like this? 
and if we put and I liked also uh, the point that the customer is the uh, not this the shopper of course at the center but but the store serving the shoppers it, it needs to be thought of in a new way and I think if we're looking at sm uh, uh, multiples of smaller brands fighting their way through all this it's a different mindset I think for the developers and I don't I don't know about the financing side of it and if their finance models as they stand today line up against it so maybe we need some finance innovation as well but this is this is I think there's a lot of excitement in play at play here and a lot of potential the world of opportunities out there yeah well, I, I think that we're starting to see uh, landlords already, uh, you know, looking at properties. It was even happening before COVID. We, we saw, you know, obviously the Oak Ridge Centre in Vancouver, Royal Mount in Montreal. We've, we've seen a few other examples where they've reimagined the real estate. We've talked about it before where there's been mixed use uh, plans for centres. But uh, overall, you know, uh, how are these centres being developed? It, it seems like they, you know, from what I, when I've talked to the developers, they are looking to future-proof their properties and they're, and they're looking for a diversity of tenants. And, they're looking at uh, opportunities for short-term tenants on top of that too. And uh, I, I think with, with, with the pandemic that we've seen and uh, um, what we've seen around innovations, again, around the supply chain, we're, we're going to start seeing, you know, autonomous vehicles driving around. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of interesting stuff around these tech companies that are doing interesting things. And uh, I, I think it's going to be exciting. And there are smart people out there that are obviously anticipating what could happen and are, are paying attention and, and hopefully those uh, you know people will be decision makers or at least influential to uh, uh, you know be able to contribute to creating retail centers with with retailers and, and other tenants to to create compelling environments so that we can have a future where we're not just sitting at home ordering online. And Craig and Craig, please include street fronts in in that vision as well. Absolutely, and the same thing with neighborhoods. I mean, uh, uh, I'd say they're a lifeblood for a lot of neighborhood. You know, for a lot, well, a lot of you know, communities around them. I'm talking about shopping neighborhoods versus residential, but, uh, uh, you know, do, do we want to see our streets die? I mean, our, our uh, you know, especially our, our denser communities, you know, Toronto, Montreal, parts of Vancouver uh, have these great neighborhoods with, with a row of shops. And, uh, and we're unfortunately in some cases seeing some of these uh, neighborhoods struggling with, with vacancies and, uh, uh, again, this is, you know, going to be a really challenging time, I think, for a lot of these neighborhoods, the BIAs are going to have to deal with it. Uh, uh, and, and I do subscribe to the broken windows theory. I think a lot of vacancies in a neighborhood is very bad. And uh, I, I think that the more that you have and the more decrepit a place looks, the less people are going to want to go. So uh, it'd be an interesting few years. I think I'm just blabbing. And this is probably and, and irrelevant Craig, at this point. Yeah, and, and Craig, let's stay away from Zoom cities. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're done and over with that thank you everyone for listening today and watching if you're watching this uh, i'm craig patterson and we were joined here again uh, with uh, claude siawal he's the uh, former president of retail at ivanhoe cambridge and we're joined of course with our regular guests i'm reading them as uh, per the order of my screen we've got gary newbury george Minakakis, christine cowan and david ian gray thank you so much everyone for uh, tuning in here today and uh, we'll be back with more content soon take care and bye for now you have been listening to the Business of Retail podcast, an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional industry discourse. Thank you for joining us. For more information, please go to www.thebusinessofretail.ca.